Here in the Rocky Mountains of Western Canada, the new sport of waterfall ice climbing evolved in the 1970s. In these mountains, we have lots of water, big cliffs, and cold, cold temperatures in the winter, perfect for forming giant frozen waterfalls. Before the 1970s, no one had dreamed of climbing these frozen waterfalls. Picks on the ice axes of the day were straight and suited only for cutting steps in moderate or low angled ice. In about 1970, Scottish mountaineer Hamish McInnes developed a new ice climbing tool called the pterodactyl. With its steeply drooping pick, it allowed climbers to hook into the ice and pull themselves up. With this tool, waterfall ice climbing became a possibility and opened a whole new sport to climbers. It was an exciting time, but it was a dangerous time. Climbers of that era didn't know whether the ice they were climbing on would stay in place or whether the weight of their bodies would pull the ice away from the mountain. But the ice usually did stay in place and a whole new sport was born. In the late 1990s, while doing research for my climbing history book, Pushing the Limits, I interviewed 84 of the leading mountaineers across the country. In this film, we have brought together some of these great tales of adventure, but it is not meant to be a complete history of the sport. Rather, it is meant to showcase these great adventurous stories. On these early climbs, very few photographs were taken, so we have augmented these stories with more modern photographs. One of the early ice climbing pioneers was Jack Firth. Originally from Yorkshire, England, he came to Canada in 1972 and very quickly got plugged into the new ice climbing scene. I interviewed Jack in his home in Canmore, Alberta in December of 1996. Here, he tells the story of climbing Pilsner Pillar with John Lachlan in 1974. When we did that, <clears throat> again it was a damp field and the ice, uh, we'd been waiting a little while for the ice to consolidate. Like, I didn't like climbing ice that's just a lot of little chandeliers, you know, and just every time you put your axe in. And I didn't have, a lot of the time we didn't have even pterodactyls early then. I had ice axes that were drooped down. I'd, at work I'd made for ice, we didn't have, ice screws were useless anyway, and things like that. I'd made long tubes like this at work and drilled a hole in the end and made some rings and welded the rings on in the end so we had like a long tube, it was just conduit with a hole with a ring on the end and you just knocked it into the ice like this, pointing down and then just put a ring. Now you could just pull it out with your fingers like that but it, at least it was sticking down as and they didn't tend to pull out as, as you moved up. I made about 10 or 11, 12 of these things when John was leading uh, Pills and the Pillar, when Eckhart and Peter were with us. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, I, and, I, and the ice, it was, I know all good ice, and usually when you get to the top of the pillar, that's when you get onto better ice, and you can start climbing in and I know John will remember he started climbing in conventional methods. Once we got to the top of that, uh, we did the other pictures above. Now I know other people don't tend to do that nowadays. They just did. They just do the pillar and that's it, and then they go back down. But I was brought up on the when we did a climb. It's not like you go up to the bolts now or you know, the chains and rappel off. You went to the sort of the top, and we went to the top of the ice, the, right up to the top. The, finished it and then we came down as best way we could. These routes we started calling them after beers, Carlsberg Column and Pilsner Pillar which were two of the popular beers at that time. I don't think you ever hardly see them too much now. 
Pilsner you do, but Carlsberg was a big common beer then, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Common bottle beer. And uh, anyway, we did another one right on at the left hand end on Mount Dennis. And I wanted to uh, name it after a British beer from Burnley. And there was a brewery in Burnley and it was called Masses, Masses Beers. And that's where Masses named after. The Professor Falls is another of Jack's great early ice climbs. Uh, and yes, that's what it's called, the Professor Falls, because on this climb, Eckhard Grassman, who was a mathematics professor at the University of Calgary, actually fell and landed in deep snow at the base of the climb and luckily was not hurt. Jack did this climb with Eckhard and John Lachlan in 1974. So we drove out the field on Friday night, I think, you know, stayed in field, found the ice wasn't good in the morning, and we drove back to Banff. And it was going to be a bit of a wasted day, really. And in the pub, in the Empress, that the Wednesday night before, we'd heard Murray Toff talking about, well, John had, about some route that he'd done on um, Rundle. So we thought, well, let's see if we can find this route, you know, and let's do it, because he said it, you know, it was a pretty good route, this route it was. So what we did, we drove back along the Trans Canada and looked across a bit, you know, to, we like driving back to Canmore. And we could see, you can see parts of this ice lower down. And we thought, well, you know, it must be somewhere over there in one of those. It won't be those right high up. That they, those desperates they do now must be somewhere low down so we went back round to the golf course parked outside Bounce Springs more or less and got our skis and started going along the front of Rundle we didn't follow the path lower down we went up towards more or less the rock bands underneath and we were up and down crashing through the forests and stuff like that just looking for any bits of ice that we perhaps could spend a few hours on all of a sudden we came we didn't come along that path at the bottom. We were up in the trees there. We came more or less right to the bottom of the climb. Sees this ice there. And hears these voices. And John and, and, John and Eckhart said, Oh, what's, there's somebody climbing up there. And, you know, there wasn't that many ice climbers. They were few and far between then. People climbing. Ice anyway. And it clicked to me straight away. I must be a little bit... I said to myself, I said to them too, straight away, get your gear on. And they said, what do you mean? I said, put your gear on, just get your stuff on right now. And they did as they were told, if you like. I said, we're soloing. And they said, no. I said, well, I am, are you? I said, we're soloing, all of us. What, what are you talking about? They were confused, their God and John. This, I said, this route hasn't been done. He's up there now, and I says, he hasn't done it. And him and Elaine Drews, we couldn't see higher up, they were on the, probably the second the pitch or something like that, higher up. And they didn't say anything to us. Well, they couldn't see us, we were sort of lower down. So, I think John set off soloing first, and Eckhart was second. Now Eckhart, he was a bit shaky, and I'm behind. So I said to Eckhart, now get out of the way, Eckhart. I said, I don't want you falling on me. I said, so I can fall and hit that snow below. I says, let me get past you. So I went past him. I got to the first pitch, up to the, where the first ledge is. And John was already there. And John was a little bit dubious about the soloing carry on. And I said, John, do you want to do this route first? And he looked good, and it's become a classic. And he said, yes. I said, all right. I said, you and Eckhart now are climbing together. We can't let Eckhart... John was quite capable of soloing it, but he wasn't that comfortable. But I said, you and Eckhart are going to climb together, because Eckhart, we can't let him solo. He had enough of a struggle on this first pitch. We can't let him solo any iron. Now, he, if he fell off that first pitch, all right. He might have hurt himself badly, but there's a, bit, a lot of deep snow at the bottom. He might have been all right as well. So John and Eckhart roped up, 
I set off soloing. They were on this sort of next section of pitches above, and I soloed past them. And then John and Eckhart, who were climbing much better than they were, passed them again. And then we waited, and we went up and carried on and finished up. And then it comes to a long sort of section. And we went up, and we came to the last pillar. And uh, it was getting late then. And I said to Eckhart, John, all right, I said, give me the roll. So I led the pitch. And I said to myself, I'm taking the rope up for you, but I'm not going to put any screws in. So I'm just soloing anyway. So I led the rope up, fixed it up at the top, and John says, throw it back down. I said, well, I've just led it without screws. He says, I want to lead it. It looks a really good pitch. And it is a really good pitch, that last one. It's the best of the lot. He says, I want to lead it anyway. I said, hey, John, it's getting late. You know, it's starting to go dark. And, Ed, and Murray Toft and Elaine Drews, they'd already turned back. They never came up to the top pitch. So, John, I couldn't argue with him. I'm not going to argue about something like that. I went round the back, came back down. John's already more or less led that pitch. Their cart went up and then they, then they came down. It started to go dark and we made our way slow. And just about when we got to the bottom, it was just about gone dark. So Murray Toft obviously wasn't very happy <laughs> about this. And but we said to him, you know, well, and uh, we went, well, we didn't argue with him or anything. When we went back next weekend to pub, we said, first ascent, you know, Eckhart Grassman, Jack Firth, John Lachlan, Elaine Drews and Murray Toft. But somehow or another, the guidebook writers, you know, they changed that. But that's how originally it was written up, mm -hmm. that uh, the, the sent to Professor's Gully. And obviously the professor, as everybody knows, was Eckhart Grassman, who right. we had lots of good times with. I mean, when I did Louise Falls, it was one of the harder climbs that, uh, that I did. I remember I led the whole thing, and there was... Uh, Eckhart, Peter, and and um, what do they call him? Uh, Tony Mould. Tony Mould. Yeah. Yeah. So what I did is I think I led the full rope length out, and I couldn't just get to the. There was a bit of a cave had formed to the left of a pillar, and uh, I led the roll, whole rope length out, and I don't think I could right reach this cave and I had to be lay say 20 feet below there and I think Tony came up and then Eckhart and Peter came up and the next pitch was took me a long long time that pitch up that pillar I couldn't get anything that was any good on there and I was I must I, it looked like a groove I'd cut up that pillar up the first 30 or 40 feet up of it to start with perhaps 30 feet of it it was like a groove I remember I chopped I must have cut tons and tons of ice away just trying to get at something that was good, you know. Because all I had, I didn't even have, a, I remember I didn't have a turret. I might have had one turret after, but I don't know, I don't think I did. I had an ice axe of Chris's that I'd, I'd drooped the pick at work. And I, I always notch my axes. I used the, what I did is, I notched them more deeply than the original notches and I put more in them and higher up the blade. So this is what I had as, you know, tools. And I remember when I got higher up, the ice got better. And I led like a, I don't know, a 70-foot pitch or something like that. And B laid up there above the cave and then brought the others up. And this is, next pitch was one of the pitches you sort of, like you dream about sort of thing. Because the pitch was reasonably difficult, but I was climbing pretty confidently. And it, but the, the, I remember climbing up there, and, the, and you know what it's like. Sometimes you hit that ice and you get a big plate coming off there, and there were plates. It was really bad ice in a way. It was plating all the time. But when I got up right at the top, where you get, and it's a real steep hillside that comes down into there, there was a tree coming down, stuck there. And it, I climbed out of the ice with my pterodactyls or hammers, well, it, they actually ice axes, into the tree, I was sticking them into the tree and I actually climbed out 
you know, off the ice, like you imagine them, how good can it get, you know, <laughs> something to get off, because that's often a dangerous point where you leave the ice and try and get onto the snow, you know, and there's a tree there you can stick your tools into and climb out of it, you know, without feeling like you're going to slip off there. Soon, Jack and his friends turned their attention to some of the other great unclimbed waterfalls. One of these was Takaka Falls, far up the Yoho Valley. Access was difficult and conditions were unpredictable. On their first attempt, the temperature went down to minus 45 degrees, but they got halfway up the climb and then a big dump of snow turned them back. Several weeks later, they returned. John Lachlan, Jack, of course, Rob Wood, and Bugs McKee. They skied the 12 kilometers into Takaka, and then to begin the climb, they had to free the ropes from the first attempt, which were frozen in the ice. We had a lot of problems getting the ropes out of the ice, because they were frozen in. And we chopped them out, got up, got up to the next pitch, and then I led another. And then there was a, like a half, a, a bit of a, say, 30 foot, so I went up to the top of this rope, and then I led another pitch up and round and got ropes fixed, say two pitches above the cave or something like that, and one, something like that anyway. And then came back down, and John and Rob had already come up and started digging this cave out, and we got this cave dug out on that ledge, and we slept in that cave that night, got up early next morning. Now John and Rob went in front, and Rob... Uh, uh, Bugs and I sort of followed them, and we just got up. It was sort of, it was a, I remember climbing, it was spin drift, loads of spin drift avalanche all the time. I mean, there's nothing really to avalanche above it, but it was just coming down off the actual climb. And it was, I remember, it was fairly late when we got right to the top, and there's like a little gully at the top. Have you done it, Chip? No. There's like a little gully at the top, and we, we got a bolt in. I mean, Rob had already put a bolt in by the time we came up. <clears throat> and then we rappelled off and we rappelled off screws, you know, on the way down. And we collected our, some of our ropes that we had down there. But we were pretty elated when we got down. And uh, yeah. but there wasn't any feeling that we were doing something incredible or new or anything like that. I, it was just, I say, I, I, they were good people I climbed with. One of the most challenging climbs of this era was called Borjo Left Hand. It was a formidable challenge and pushed the first ascensionists right to their limit. Rob Wood told me the story of this climb in August of 1996. It, it had always seemed inconceivable to any of us that uh, anybody could possibly climb that. It was totally beyond the imagination that, that anybody was. It was so big and so steep and intimidating that you know, it was just considered to be future generation material. And, e and even when people did go to the bottom of it, it was really just to have a look, you know. I mean, it didn't really occur to anybody that it was, it was actually really possible to climb that. It, it wasn't as if, you know, a person could get up early in the morning and get off to a good start and think that they were going to knock that guy at that climb off. That wasn't the way it was. It was... It was a matter of going and experiment. We were experimenting, you know. We, we went up on it and see how we get on, and then we'll come back, you know. Mm. And um, it was only gradually that uh, it really occurred to us that we could actually climb it. Yeah. When we did actually get going on it, which was the third successive day, we started right from the bottom and jumped up our fixed ropes and and um, got climbing in up out of the bowl there and. Uh, the progress was very, very slow because we were we were so um, tentative, you know, so so hesitant to, to commit ourselves and so scared, frankly. But the crux happened uh, late that day when um, it got to be one of those things where it was going to be easier to to get up it and get going and come down the easy way than it was to to come all the way back down and have to come up another weekend. So. Uh, we were really keen to get off, but the problem was that the, the last pitch it just got steeper and steeper, as you probably know. It's, uh, and Tim was uh, 
working on this last pitch and um, he got, the way I remember it anyway is that he got so far and was getting really um, really stretched out and eventually put a bolt in and, uh, and came, came down and I went up and swung it and took over his lead. It wasn't dark yet, but it was it was close to getting dark. And you know the idea of getting caught out and bivouacking in the kind of temperatures that we were dealing with there was horrendous. So I was just totally um, motivated to to get up, get up and get in order to get off because I was so scared. That last pitch, as well as being horrendously steep, was um, just really rotten ice and running with water on the inside. So. Almost every time you poked your ice, uh, your axe in, you got spurted. Uh, ice cold water came spurting out, and I I remember being totally covered in ice. All of my clothing and everything was all cracked. Carabiners were frozen shut. Ice screws were all frozen up. I couldn't put ice screws in. Just couldn't get them to work. It was just too much trouble to try to unfreeze them. So I just climbed. I just kept going. I don't even think I had any protection. This was harder more serious. It was just as technically difficult as anything anybody had ever done as far as we knew. And added to that was all of the other factors that we were having to deal with. That uh, The length of the climb, the, uh, the overall seriousness and steepness of it, the, um, the possibility of avalanches coming down from others. The, um, putting all of these factors together um, made for an overall serious you know, grade of seriousness that was, um, as far as we could, as far as we were aware, uh, was beyond anything that anybody had ever done before. Another great waterfall ice climber of this era was Laurie Skreslet. Born and raised in Calgary, he became devoted to the sport and pioneered two fabulous uh, waterfall ice climbs. Uh, Helmet Falls in 1976 with Robbie Mitchell and White Man Falls in 1979 with Dave Wright. And then doing the White Man's Falls with uh, and that was neat. That was one special place where it's as though the world became surreal because the lay of the rock was at odds with the sense of vertical. So when you're in there everything is askew. It's like Ka uh, Calvin and Calvin and Hobbes working up, uh, waking up in a neo-cubist world where, where everything is, is just slightly off-center as you're walking around. <laughs> and that's the way it felt on uh, White Man's Falls. It was a unique, powerful little gorge in there. It still is, of course. That was, that was a nice short-term quick hit that, that felt really positive. But I, I don't think anything ever compared to doing, going in and doing I tried that many times getting in. Sometimes I couldn't even reach the waterfall. The snow was so deep and the avalanche hazard was so high. So to finally pull it off, just him and I, that was really neat. One of the aspects of mountaineering that's been so powerful for me, and that is seeing that sense of comradeship develop between people, where you know you could trust this person to the last breath of your life, and you would give the same for him or for her. Man, that's powerful for me. That was, that was a pleasure, but I think the best, the best and most satisfying was Helmet Falls. So when I went in with Mitchell, another guy who probably never received the credit that he's due, this guy, man, just just a, a solid as rock, just a tremendous anchor. You know, this guy, right there, fully committed, right to the end. You know, we climbed halfway, bivied in a snow cave we dug out, and then with the broken crampons, we climbed, he had broken crampons, we climbed it right to the top. Man, there's nothing setting Rob back. He'd sidestep with the, the crampon that had lost his front points on this vertical ice right to the top. When we came down that, man, I felt so proud. Most people don't understand why. Like, it, it was a long way in to ski into this thing with huge packs. There's nobody who's going to help you if you got into trouble. We did it competently and in good style and skied all the way up. And Rob's pack, I swear, weighed more than he did. It was the middle of winter. I, now, that, the sense of satisfaction that went with doing that route went right to the core of my being. I felt so good about that. When Albie Sowell came to Canada in the late 70s, the sport of waterfall ice climbing was well established, but Albie soon found his way to the leading edge of the sport. One of Albie's finest climbs came in 1979 when he climbed Weeping Pillar with James Blinch. 
This climb set a new standard for what was possible in the sport. I had done some waterfall climbing in England actually. There's some waterfalls in right around Derbyshire that perform up for like five or six hours once a winter and we, we went and did some of that and also in Scotland I'd done some ice climbing. But I really took to it, it was so bizarre and uh, I really enjoyed it for a period of four or five years. And I think I was, it was actually, there was a lull in ice climbing. There was the initial exploration with John Laughlin and Jack Firth and, and Jerry Rogan and, and Laurie Scresley went out and did, you know, all the big first ascents of things like Tacker and Helmet Falls and Polar Circus and so on. It was that initial exploration. I pretty, pretty much everything we did was an early ascent because there was not, not that much had been done. And it wasn't until 78, 79 was when I saw the Tacker Falls. The weather was nice. The climb, the climb was actually rotting. It was starting to fall apart. In the middle section, it was quite difficult to get. It was very thin, rotten ice. And I know John the week before ended up with his feet going through the ice. And he was left hanging on his tools. Mm -hmm. And I managed to avoid that particular terror. But uh, you know, it just went really smoothly. I felt really strong, and uh, I felt completely in control of the situation. And that's the way the soul. When I hear stories of people you know, who are on the edge of meeting their maker, I think, boy, it's not the solo I want to do. No. And then it was the next winter that we did. Um, did the Weeping Pillar and did Polar Circus. and That would have been the winter of 79, 80 that we did those first three ascents. And, and that was when I started writing the guidebook to waterfall ice climbing. But, well, James and I uh, were, were really tuned up. We had done the weekend before the uh, central pillar, and it was in very hard conditions. I don't think I really had worked out at that time that some of these climbs could be a lot easier if you picked your day, and we did it in very hard chandelier ice, very difficult conditions. So we were really tuned up, and we went to, to Nemesis, and uh, John, who had not been with us on the previous climb, and realized he was missing out on some good stuff, came along. James, I think it was James, or fell off about four times with the ice just coming away with this, the tools and everything from the pitch I'd just left. It was very thin. The, the line I'd taken up was very thin. And so we were kind of freaked out. We went back and came back the following weekend. And John had reoriented himself and took that first pitch and took a slightly different line, just nailed right up it, fully psyched, you know. I was looking around for the hardest thing that I could do talk James into doing this thing. It, it's a contrived line, you know what I mean, for sure. To call it another name is, is ego on my part. But, but we just took the, the hardest, steepest line we could up the lower wall and the hardest, steepest line we could find up the upper wall. But I, what I remember about it is that to us it felt totally out there. And uh, that I was quite, I remember leading long sections because the ice crews were not as good as they are now. And, we were committed to this no hanging on the tools to place ice crews leading you know, 30, 40, 50 feet without ice crews above ledges, knowing that if you fell, you were going to take a 60, 70 foot fall into a ledge. And, and the ice was really poor. And at the end of it, feeling absolutely exhausted, as I'm sure James was too, you know, just, just mentally drained. And, but feeling, having done it, that we'd really broken some new ground in ice climbing, which I think we had, you know, for that time. In the early 80s, the sport evolved even more. A new group of young, talented climbers appeared on the scene and pushed the limits even farther. Barry Blanchard, Kevin Doyle, and Tim Friesen climbed many of those big old grade six routes in one day from the car. And they pioneered some very difficult new climbs of their own. One of the most difficult was Gimme Shelter, which Doyle and Friesen climbed in 1983. An iconic piece of ice that forms some winters high on the cliffs of Mount Rundle caught the attention of climbers and was considered to perhaps be the limit of what was possible. In 1985, Craig Reason and Jay Smith, a couple of Americans, climbed this waterfall and named it the Terminator.
shortly after, a new climber appeared on the scene from Quebec, Guy Lasselle. When I came to the Canadian Rockies, I thought all the waterfalls would be like the Terminator or harder. Not all of them, but like the Great Five and stuff. That's how I imagined they'd be. And then as I started climbing, I remember our first time I was with Sean Perron, we on our way to Professor Fall, and I saw the Terminator, and I thought, well, that looks a bit steep for a Great Four. And we thought that was like the Professor Fall. And Sean said, well, if that's a Great Four, I'm leaving right now. <laughs> and then we got to Professor, and that was a Great Four, and I remember. Uh, Sean uh, didn't have all his equipment. I remember sawing the route thinking, oh, maybe I'm not going to do too bad here, you know, I'll be able to do a lot of routes. And uh, James Blanche, uh, who had uh, taught a course to a friend of mine, uh, this friend told me, go see James when you get there, he'll help you around. Then I went out with James and we did some, some fine climbing. And I realized that the routes were actually accessible at, you know, the level I was climbing. Yeah. Because when we did Polar Circus, PNI, Chassis, you didn't know about things more than I did. And we thought the route that you can see from the road, because I imagine Polish Circus being like 2,000 feet of vertical ice. So we did. We thought that would be like the first steps. You know how they describe in the, the old guidebook as there's like two days of climbing, if you do in two days. We thought what we could see was the first day of climbing. So we decided we'd solo that, so we'd be you know, early enough on top of that to do the big air wall on top. And it's only near the top that we realized that was, that was the actually polar circus, that was the climb. Yeah. So then I guess we started realizing that, uh, yeah, we can climb pretty much as well as the people from the place and uh, started getting more confident about doing grade six and discovering new routes. Actually, I was working on Bound all that winter. I just came for a week of uh, climbing. And Alain Chassis and I, uh, the day before that, or two days before that, we went out climbing. And did all the Tabernacle and then we did the climb above that we call Oro Capitan. And then on the way back, my old Volkswagen van died. So we spent the night sleeping in my van with no sleeping bags. So we were really cold. And I thought that was it for me because I had to go back to Ontario. And I drove in front of Terminator, like the van got started in the morning and I got it fixed. And after a sleepless night, I drove in front of the Terminator and I thought, geez, if I don't climb it, this thing tomorrow, which was my last day where I was supposed to pack and leave, I said, I probably maybe never get a chance, maybe I'll never form again. And inside I was right, it, it formed this year, but I hadn't formed since. So I said, well, I'll just give it a go, because you had been climbing only once then. But it took a couple of days. Uh, it's a lot harder when you do the first descent, psychologically, and, and knowing about the climb. So I called Alain, and he says, well, we can't go tomorrow, we haven't slept last night. I says, well, it's the only day I can go. So he said, okay, let's go. So we got up early. We started hiking around five, and we did all the lower pitches, and uh, we got to the base. It was already 11 o'clock, and it's a pretty long, steep climb. And uh, the, the equipment we had was pretty good, but not. It couldn't go quite as fast. Like the screw were still like, you know, the one that you have to screw in with your hammer and stuff. We, we topped just before dark and came back down. Uh, I remember when I finished, I didn't actually didn't feel the enjoyment right then because it was just too hard not having climbed much that winter and remember that I probably would never go back there because it was just like too hard but uh, now that it's formed this year I'm thinking of going back Yeah. Right? but with a little <coughs> more experience and, and better equipment and, and it wouldn't be me you know and proper training this time would probably be more enjoyable because I think it's neat to do stuff that are really hard for you but as long as you feel like you're, you're feeling strong and confident because you, you've been climbing a lot to prepare you for your, your climb, I get more enjoyment out of that. Because for me, climbing, the, it's the most worthwhile time is while I'm on the climb. It's not after it's done. So it's got to be quite good while I'm on it. It doesn't mean it has to be super fun all the time because sometimes it is hard and intense. But still, you get quite a satisfaction while you're doing it. If you feel comfortable and safe on the climb, soloing is, well, obviously faster, so you don't have to get at 4 in the morning for a long climb. Sometimes I'd get up at 9 and start climbing just as the ice is getting nice and soft, you know, the sun's been hitting it. So I climb it when it's easier to climb and not having to stop for belays, because that's really hard to start once you've been belaying and cold, you know, to get back into the movement. I think, uh, in my perspective, oftentimes soloing a climb for me will feel safer, because I'm I'm warm throughout, I have plenty of time to go up and down, I 
I never had to sleep out on, on a climb. And um, also, it's like you can appreciate things when you're by yourself that you might forget when you're what having conversation with other people. Or there's a, there's quality to both, you know, to a partnership on a climb or doing it alone, where you can hear everything, feel everything. So, you know, it's, it has its, its big attraction for me. Yeah. In the late 80s, another new, fine climber appeared on the scene. Uh, Bruce Hendricks came to Calgary, to the University of Calgary, from California. This whole scene is filled with incredibly great quality people. Not just good climbers, but people who are really, I think, outstanding human beings. And Guy's another example of that. Um, Guy, I think, is the most widely traveled, widely climbed Canadian ice climber. I don't think there's anybody who's, who's climbed ice more places in the world and probably done more pitches than he has. And Guy's had a lot of impact because he came out from Quebec thinking that the standards out here were much higher than they were in Quebec and discovered that, wow, no, what they were doing out there was every bit as hard as the hard stuff getting done out here. And in fact, they'd been undergrading the roots back there by at least a grade. So uh, a lot of the stuff that he's done out here, you know, you just dr any drive the ice fields parkway to the Banff Jasper or the, uh, the Trans Canada, and any route that has a French name was probably done by Guy, and there are a lot of them, yeah. really classic, good routes. Some of my better days were not necessarily a day, like a day on Terminator was memorable, but some days I had so much fun, like I remember doing Cascade Fall with just one tool and just working my balance and coming on the top and feeling as good as that as anything or, or doing um, uh, Guinness Gully and the stout on top you know? going up the Guinness Gully, do the stouts and the other one, the other pitch next to it and then just bump sliding to my car and, and it would take only like three hours to go up and down so it would be fun to move that fast and come down that fast and I just those days to me are just uh, as, as, as good as, let's say, when I did a hard grade six or something. Mm -hmm. and mixing it up too is good for for your head. I think if you're always pushing yourself, you might get tired before the winter's over or, you know, or grow old sooner. <laughs> you know. I guess probably some of the better routes that, in my opinion, that I, I did waterfall-wise were things like uh, Blessed Rage, over at Emerald Lake and uh, I had tried to get a partner to go over but uh, nothing worked out so I thought this is something I really want to check out so I'll go by myself. And got to the base of this thing probably about 11 o'clock. The first pitch was kind of moderate ice and then got kind of thinner ice with snow. The lower section sits right above this really dark black decomposing band of rock and what happens is that drips with water and freezes up and then during the day it gets baked in the sun and stuff starts to fall apart. So I was staying over to the right to stay out of the fallout zone from stuff that came from up above. And there were a few things that came down. Um, after I got up through that pitch there's another, there was a kind of a thin ice, kind of thin rotten ice which Barry and Joe encountered as rock, all rock. After you make this little traverse there's this uh, really poor kind of Swiss cheese ice that leads up to the base of this stunning pillar. Just a really, really beautiful piece of ice. Still to date, the, the most sustained piece of vertical ice that I've ever encountered. You know, you get ice that's like 85 and 87, but you don't get very much ice that's just dead on vertical without features and things like that that you can play off of. And this is, that, that pillar, I would guess, was probably 30 feet, 35 feet of just dead vertical with no, no rests, no moves, no stems, no nothing like that, but perfect ice. But the ice to get to the base of the pillar was stuff that had dripped off the top and was quite aerated. And it was almost the kind of thing you'd climb with the shafts of your tools, really just poor stuff. So that was delicate climbing, and that's the section that turned Joe and Barry and Tim back. And then once onto the upper pillar, I was pretty shaken by the rockfall that had happened down below. So now I was onto the section of climbing where I felt probably the most secure, but I thought, I don't want to do anything stupid here. So I put in a bolt behind the wall, 
and I put a screw into the base of the pillar and I rope soloed the upper part. So I put in, I think, one or two screws on the first half rope length and one screw on the upper half rope length. So I did that pillar, which is one pitch, as two half pitches because of the way I was rope soloing. And I uh, finished the day, was able to wrap down a direct route, um, get back to the car by dark, and it was, it was a great day. The nice thing about being by myself in that situation is there's no one to climb for, there's no one to look good for, there's just, you just climb. And so it's, in my mind, a really pure experience. I usually see the, the, climb, the whole climbing season in, in general as a high. But there is some moments that are higher than others, and um, and usually that's when I've been climbing for a while and feeling, you know, feeling strong, feeling at ease with the movement. Usually I, I get a lot of enjoyment, uh, and that's when usually I'll go and try something a little more challenging. I think about once or twice a year I'll I'll do a solo that is not quite like like a lot of time when I'm soloing it's like cross country skiing. I'm doing the activity of climbing, but there's not an intensity of commitment. And once or twice a year I'll commit to a bigger climb. And there's this climb in Norway, in the Foss, and it's just an amazing piece of ice. Yeah. That's like 500 feet of really steep ice. and It's just a beautiful climb. Like sometime I'll do a solo, but it, it feels like I was a little bit off the safety zone. Then even if I succeed, it doesn't feel as good as if uh, like those climbs are memorable for me because I remember doing it fairly, feeling competent on every placement and feeling strong throughout the climb. It was never like, ooh, am I going to fall in? Although there were many fine, strong climbers on the waterfall ice climbing scene during the 70s and 80s, one of the very best was Jeff Marshall. Born and raised in Calgary, this man was a great rock climber and pushed ice climbing right to the very limit. In 1986, he linked Polar Circus and Weeping Pillar in one single day in Chainman. In 1987, Jeff and his pals pioneered a new, very difficult route high on the walls of Mount Patterson that they called Riptide. This climb took ice climbing into a whole new world of difficulty. I, I had been envisioning these uh, enchainments. For some reason or other, I was taken by these, these ideas. And uh, I thought, big climbing, big mileage, this, that, and everything else, right? And I was really keen for it. It you know, just had to be done. So I went out and did it. <laughs> <laughs> got pretty damn serious at that time in life about, yeah. about this climbing, which doesn't, you know, I mean, i just serious about the climbing part of it, right? And once I started climbing on Polar Circus, I was fine. Yeah. I didn't stop, really, no. <clears throat> to, didn't really hesitate much, you know, the route was in really good shape, and uh, snow and all that stuff was in good shape, and <clears throat> yeah, I uh, cleaned Polar Circus up pretty fast. The back of the truck by 10.30 in the morning. Yeah, yeah. So... But then going down to uh, mm -hmm. Weeping Pillar. Yeah, that was a that was a tough one, because um, that was a serious business. Yeah. You know? And that was that whole thing is that <clears throat> I had developed a head at that point in time to deal with the shit, you know, and shit did happen in a big way. I mean, I climbed some of the most technical ice in my life on that last picture. It certainly felt like it, you know, just uh, icicles rotten. Um, melting out, all sorts of shit. And mm. it was, uh, you know, standing right up on end as anybody who's ever been up there will, will attest. That, uh, mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it was pretty pretty full on. What was exciting about it was that you'd had this vision and that it was like the impossible vision and uh, carried it through. Yeah. And pulled it off. Yeah. And it was a neat, neat frame of mind. Yeah, yeah so tell me about Borderline. Uh, was it borderline? Well, it wasn't. It was borderline in terms of it was actually stupid because we we're fully exposing ourselves to Cirax, mm. and I had no idea we were doing that because I do have a <coughs> rule about climbing under Cirax. I don't do it. Mm. 
doesn't do anything for me and it doesn't enhance the route or make it more difficult it's just plain old dumb <laughs> to yeah. climb under sea yeah so we ended up calling it borderline because that's as far over as you really want to climb like there's another gully or two that has ice in them and stuff <clears throat> point being that we climbed under a fully doubly overhung Syrac wall and Barry had told me about this route and said oh yeah it's really good and stuff so we uh I just went and I started off in the wee hours and by the time one can see anything you're already on the route so you look up you see this stuff hanging over your head and you go what's that no it's an optical illusion or whatever right well it wasn't <laughs> and I think you know we got lucky yeah <clears throat> Riptide on the other hand is a lot safer it's on the very edge of a, a glacier certainly I've climbed some of the hardest pitches on ice I've ever done on Riptide the thing about ice climbing is I'm an old style ice climber. As far as I'm concerned, ice climbing is like grade five. That's as hard as ice gets. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> routes like Weeping Pillar and so on and so forth and all these other routes, they are grade five pitches. Everybody wants to call them a grade six pitch, right? If it's 50 meters, I still have a real hard time with that. But the uh, <clears throat> point is we had five really hard grade five pitches in a row, just one after the other. <clears throat> and... Uh, you know, thin, shitty ice, sketchy gear, if any gear at all, and uh, huge falls, stuff like that. And, uh, yeah, so we, well, we called it a six plus, but <clears throat> people insisted it was a seven, so. Yeah. There, there was a couple other guys that had gotten their asses kicked on it that were quite reputable ice climbers um, just prior to us going up there. And it's funny how those things work because, well, <clears throat> People climb it, or last, I guess it's been climbed a number of times now, and people call it a like a 6+, plus, but uh, I, uh, I think there's been more ice on it, be it considerably more or just more ice than when we did it. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a lead climb, it's still the most psychotic ice climb. I mean, it was right out there. It's maintained its reputation. Well, even when it's bad. Yeah. It's still, um, yeah, it's still hard. People call it a 6+, plus, I guess, or something. Yeah. Whatever. <laughs> Another route that uh, I did was called Fearful Symmetry, and it was in the Ghost in a place called the Recital Hall. And what had happened there was, in the second edition of the Waterfall Ice Guide, there's a photo on the kind of front piece that says an unclimbed waterfall in the Ghost. And this thing, I mean, the photo, it's quite amazing. And I thought, I would love to know where that thing is, and I'd love to know whether somebody could get up it. And uh, what happened was, Joe went in with Brad Robleski and did a route called Rainbow Serpent. And when he came back and told me about it and said, hey, you got to go do this route, he said, oh, yeah, you know that picture? Well, that route, it's Rainbow Serpent's right across from it. I thought, oh, I've got to go see this place. So Sheila and I went up, and while we were on um, Rainbow Serpent looking back across, I thought, I think you can climb that thing. So I went over to it after we got off uh, with Sheila, but we were out of time. At that point in time, Joe hadn't even looked at it as a route. He just thought, that's not something you would do. So we went back and uh, went over to the base of this thing and banged on it, and it seemed like it was going to stay in place. So went up and just gently got up onto this, worked up that initial kind of pedestal, and uh, got onto the upper pillar and just climbed a fair distance before putting in a screw because I didn't want something to snap off lower and have a screw in it. But uh, the ice was quite solid and it it was a strenuous climb because it was quite steep but the way it worked you ended up working your way through these overhangs in and around so there were some really kind of devious lines that allowed you to do some pretty radically steep climbing without getting into the overhung realm and uh, when you wrapped off the route you were probably Ooh, between 10 and 15 feet away from the wall, you know, where the rope dropped, and you had to get swinging to get in in order to get off the rope. And so that route and another route that Joe and I did called Dancing with Chaos up on the Ice Fields Parkway and, uh, and Blessed Rage all kind of fit together to say, you know, the limits are way out there somewhere. From, you know, the times of Bugs McKeith and John Lachlan and um, the introduction of the pterodactyls and climbing big lines. Now the move has been more and more toward climbing thinner lines. And in the last 
four years probably that's gone really big time. It's gotten a lot of publicity and ice climbing has become very popular. This is a mecca for ice climbing. People come from all over the world to climb here because we have such good routes and they're so consistent because of the temperatures. So there are lots of visiting climbers who are real talented who come and, and who have historically done a lot of good routes. I think most of the new routes now that are going up are done by Canadians. Um, but there are still some exceptions to that. So where it's come from is pushing steeper lines and now steepness doesn't seem to be so much the factor. It's the quality of the ice and the amount of the ice. And then inevitably that gets involved with mixed climbing. So you're dry tooling on rock or mixing it up where you've got, you're using different things at different times, ice, snow, rock, mud, turf, whatever. Yeah. And uh, so that's definitely been, been the direction things have gone. And I think they'll continue to go that way. I think they'll, the, the level of mixed climbing will increase as people who've spent lots of time on rock apply what they've learned there to the, to the ice and, and mixed environment. Well, I guess if there's any message I could pass on through all these years is like a, I'm, I'm glad that in my first few years when I was more cocky and taking more risk and I managed to survive those years to enjoy you know the climbing that I've done for the last 18 years and I know it's hard when you're just starting you know to hold back because you really want to prove to yourself or sometimes to other people that you can do these are things but uh, you just got to think about yourself first you know to make sure you, you know, don't make anything foolish you yeah. know there's always risk when you're out there even like uh, when you're careful like I you know I can get in an accident now even though I'm careful but to try to to limit that uh, and not to to do things for other people but mainly do them for you and if you're climbing for yourself you probably be more careful or that doesn't mean you don't take a certain amount of risk but for the right reason and the right way the way I sometimes think of it and it occurred to us at that time was that um, the conventional notion is that people escape to the mountains at weekends. Um, you know, escaping from reality. Sometimes some people have even, acu I remember being accused by some people as being, you know, mountaineering is an escape from reality. And um, But to us it became apparent that we got so excited by the Canadian landscape and spending time out in the wilds. We got so, I would use the word spiritual now, I don't think I would have done then, but we're so uh, empowered by it, so uh, turned on if you like, that it occurred to us that it wasn't escaping from reality, it was escaping to reality. Yeah. The, the yeah. reality that we found in the mountains, the reality that we found amongst ourselves on these big ice climbs was something that was way more real than, than what we experienced in the normal life in the city. And you sort of get hooked on it. 